All right, this is uh, lesson number three, elders, deacons, preachers, saints. And uh, this particular lesson is entitled Elder, the Character Profile. And we're kind of, as Hal said, diving into a more specific material on this uh, series. Uh, in our previous uh, lessons on the subject of uh, elders and deacons and preachers, uh, we've established a couple of core ideas, so the, the, the foundation of the stuff that we've been talking about. So first core idea is uh, that there are specific roles which are based on responsibility and aptitude and appointment in the church. Um, we've said that men serve as elders or preachers or deacons because uh, they have certain abilities. Uh, they're appointed to their tasks by the church and the main difference between uh, these roles and, and, and the rest of the church is the fact that they have been given certain responsibility. Remember I said, uh, um, you know, everybody should uh, share their faith. You know, that's a, you know, everybody should share their faith, but some in the church have uh, the skill and the training and uh, the uh, appointment to do this on a full-time basis and do only this with their, uh, with their working lives. Uh, uh, so we talked about that in the first uh, couple of lessons. Also, we said that church leadership rests with Christ um, and is embodied by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and is exercised uh, in real time, if you wish, uh, by the uh, elders. So uh, our goal was to um, uh, move away from the denominational model of the, what I call the preacher-centered, you know, or the pastor-centered church where the pulpit guy, the pulpit preacher, or the pastor, quote, uh, is the main person, the manager, the minister, the caregiver, uh, the general manager of the church, everything runs through him. You know, we see that model in uh, denominational churches. And move away from that to a more biblical model of the elder-centered church, where the elders are the ones who lead, not the only ones who do it, but who lead in the teaching, and the ministering, the shepherding, of the church, that's a much more uh, biblically uh, themed uh, uh, and organized church. And then the third core idea we talked about so far is that this series that we're doing is not simply an academic exercise. You know, it's not that people sitting, listening to this are going, oh, that's nice, you know, and moving on. You know, this, is a, this is a very practical type of uh, lesson, um, and I'm doing it with the hope that It'll motivate our, certainly our existing elders and preachers and deacons and saints, and will also stimulate others to step forward into these roles who are not yet serving at the capacity that they should be serving. So a little motivational uh, information while we have it. All right, so today we're going to begin looking at the kind of man that the elder is, and in the weeks to follow, uh, we'll look at the work he does, and then how to choose elders, and then a section on the wives of elders before we move on to preachers and deacons and saints and so on and so forth. Okay. Now before we look at and explain the very specific requirements for qualifications as elders, I want to examine a kind of a, you know, broader characteristics that are necessary, that are easier to see in a person when trying to recognize who among us should serve in this capacity. So we're all familiar, well, I say all, I think most of us have heard lessons on you know, who should be an elder. We go to First Timothy, we go to Titus, and so on and so forth. Those are very specific qualities. I want to just you know, widen the scope a little bit here and look at some of the broader uh, qualifications uh, for, for not, not just elders, but for all Christians, but especially those who are going to serve as elders, there's some kind of generic qualifications that help us identify what kind of man is truly you know, eldership material, okay? So a couple of ideas along this line. Well, first of all, this man accepts the Bible as God's word and only standard within the church. So if you're saying, okay, what kind of man are we looking for, you know, as far as elders, before we get you know, the husband of one wife, apt to teach, you know, before we get to those specific things, what kind of guy are we looking for? Well, we're certainly looking for a man who accepts the Bible as God's word and, and certainly will not deviate from that, from that thought. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
A familiar passage, we, read, we will be reading this one a lot in this series. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, in that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, there's the idea, all scripture. You know that a man is elder material if he understands and accepts the idea and promotes the idea that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And so a person who is not yet convinced of this idea that all scripture is inspired by God and the scriptures themselves are the tool that God uses and the Spirit uses uh, to teach and to reprove, to correct, in other words, to do the work of the church. Um, uh, a person who's not convinced of that idea cannot defend this idea and that person lacks the fundamental component for uh, successful leadership in Christ's church. You, you've got to be convinced that, th that this is God's word and this is enough to do the work of the elders. Of course, all of us read other books. I mean, I read the Bible and hopefully I try to every single day in my own personal devotional time, but I read other books too. You know, I read books on business and history and you know, World War II and sometimes I read a, uh, you know, fiction books just for entertainment, because I like to read, I read lots of books. You know? But when I'm working in the church trying to resolve an issue or a problem, so on and so forth, this is the, this is the reference book. I don't consult business books in order to figure out how the church ought to be organized better. See what I'm saying? This is the book I go to to figure out how to organize the church, how to motivate the church, and so on and so forth. I, I don't go to motivational books written by business leaders or, 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 or you know, uh, speakers, popular speakers, astronauts, whatever, that go on the tour. I, I, those are good books. I learn a lot of stuff from that. But anything I want to get done in the church, this is the only reference I go to. This book here, because this has the final say on those topics. And so the major tool for the elder is the word of God. If he doesn't know it, or he doesn't believe that it is God's word, or if he doesn't go to it for direction and counsel, um, he will eventually lead God's people away uh, into some form of apostasy. So if you're looking at you know, uh, elder material, uh, first step, you know, does this person rely on God's word exclusively? So one of the, that's what I'm shooting at today, general characteristics. Number two, elders love the church. The elders love the church. In Ephesians 5.25, Paul says, you know, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ loved the church and died for it. That's one of the basic tenets of Christianity, of course. And Christ's elders should be mature enough to see the church with all of its faults, all of its sins, all of its immaturity at times, and still love it. Not always easy to love the church because, I don't know about you guys, but if you're in the church long enough, you'll, you'll probably have your feelings hurt more by people in the church than people outside the church. That's a kind of an ironic thing, you know? But that's how it, that's how it works, because that becomes your family. So certainly elders need to be able to love the church despite the things that they see in it which give them pause or sorrow. You know, it's like the parent who loves his rebellious child? Well, the, the elder loves the church regardless of its failure, because if he doesn't, who is going to love the church? Not the politicians. The politicians aren't going to be the ones who love the church. It's not their job. The ones who are in charge of public security, policemen, fire, you know, all those, they're not their job to protect the church, the building maybe, but the church that's the elder's responsibility. He's the one that loves the church. So if there's a man you know, uh, that you're thinking about, but what you hear from him are complaints about the church, and oh, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, this is not the person that you're looking for to be your leader. You're looking for the person who loves the church, who defends the church. Number three, elders know how to worship God in every context of life. 
Romans chapter 12. Paul says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So in this particular verse, Paul equates service and purity as our everyday worship. You know, if I am being tempted you know, on a Tuesday afternoon, if I am being tempted uh, to be ugly, to have a bad attitude, to think negatively, to seek vengeance or whatever in some small way against a person who has wronged me or hurt my feelings or whatever, and, you know, and I resist that impulse, that very natural impulse, you know, it's human, we want to get even. Somebody hurts us, we want to hurt them back. You know? But I resist, I resist that temptation of my flesh. I call out to God and say, Lord, this is, I know I'm feeling this way, but I don't want to feel this way. I, I, I do want to respond here as a, as a godly man to this situation. Please help me. And I managed to get over that hump in that day that's my spiritual worship happening. I am, I am seeking to remain pure. Pure is not just about you know, sexual immorality. Pure is also a pure conscience and a pure heart devoid of anger, resentment, revenge, and, and all the other things. As I seek to keep my heart pure, I am, I am, I am daily offering my worship to God. Okay. So Paul equates this type of service and purity as our everyday worship, as opposed to our congregational worship, which, which consists of, of songs and prayers and communion, teaching, giving. You know, the leaders of the church are able to lead in both types of worship. Yes, it's good that we have an elder who can lead singing, that's wonderful. I think most of our elders can lead singing. That's a marvelous gift that they have. But in, additional, in addition to that gift, I'm hoping that our elders are also, on a Tuesday afternoon, able to overcome the temptation of taking revenge for something that has been done to them. And I'm asking for both skills. I'm looking for a person who has both those kinds, of, those kinds of skills. So the leaders of the church are able to lead in both ways of worship. They can lead in corporate worship, but they also can demonstrate that everyday kind of worship. You know, too many times we choose only the ones who are good at leading you know, maybe long prayers or can lead the you know, can, 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 can lead singing or so on and so forth, without examining what kind of spiritual service of worship they may be offering during the rest of the week. You know, um, being an elder, very much like being a father, is not a one time a week thing. You're a dad, you know, Sunday to Sunday, to Sunday. you're a dad seven days a week all the time. That, that responsibility is on you all the time. If you're a father of children, it's the same thing. As if you're an elder, you're, you're an elder all the time, not just when you are actually inside the building. Very important to, to realize that. And so this man that we're looking for knows how to worship God in every context of life. Number four, this man works well with others. Talk about something practical. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Paul says, What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So the work of an elder is a, is a people job, is a people job. If you're good at working with things, fixing things, doing things, organizing things, building things, repairing things, that's good. That's a good thing. But that's not a qualification for you to be an elder. <laughs> you have to be good with people. 
If you can't drive a nail and a hammer, that's okay. That doesn't disqualify you in service as an elder. But if you can't deal with people, if you'd rather be alone, <laughs> this is not a good thing. You ought not to aspire to be an elder if you just prefer being alone and by yourself, being left alone in your shop. If that's the person you are, well good, God's given you certain skills, but please, you know, don't, aspire to the, don't aspire to the elder job. Not only does the elder work with the congregation through teaching and through counseling, but he must also work with other elders. He must also work with preachers. He must also work with deacons in aside, aside from the congregation. You know, in the passage that, that I've read here, Paul diffuses a potentially divisive situation at Corinth by giving God the glory for the harvest and distributing the credit for the work to everyone. Because that was the problem here. You know, people were trying to, trying to take credit and you know, kind of round up a, a group of followers. So God's leader is recognized for his ability to foster unity and peace, not for his ability to get his own way. The most dangerous person in a church is the person who polarizes. You know what I'm saying? If the issue is what color is the carpet going to be in the auditorium because we're changing the carpet, and if you have a person that is able to polarize people around blue, you be careful of that person. The leader in the church we're looking for is the individual who can bring people together, who can take different kinds of people and find a way to bring them together, not, not you know, push them apart. You know, elders do not confuse leadership with self-will. The big difference. Number five. Uh, well, I think, I'm sorry, uh, I, I forgot to read the, uh, the ongoing passage here, verse uh, seven to nine uh, in uh, Corinthians. Uh, Paul also says, so then neither the one who plants for the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field and God's building. Again, sorry, I forgot to read the rest of that passage. Again, Paul is demonstrating how leaders bring people together, not separate them. Okay, next one. There we go, number five. Um, elders know how to make decisions, or at least this person that you might be considering, knows how to make decisions. Another passage we want to read in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, uh, Luke writes, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all that God had done with them. Talking about Paul returning to Jerusalem, talking about uh, his uh, missionary journeys and the things that he had accomplished. And then in verse five it goes on to say, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and elders came together to look into this matter. Then we're going to skip down to verse 22 and 23 because he goes on and talks about the debate that went on and the discussion that went on. And then in verse 23 he says, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they sent this letter by them, the apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. And then he goes on and on to give their decision. That's not exactly what I'm focusing on here. Um, here I'm focusing on the idea of making decisions. Notice there was a problem here. The problem was one group in the church was saying, these Gentiles, these newcomers, uh, they can't come into the church unless they're circumcised. The idea was unless they become Jews first, unless they obey the law and the cultural, uh, the cultural rituals of Judaism, they cannot become Christians. To us today, 2,000 years later, we say, well, that's just ridiculous. 
But in the first century, if the first Christians were Jews and they were the ones who were in positions of leadership many times in the congregations, that was a big issue. So notice what happens here. They get together, the apostles and the elders, to discuss the matter. The point I'm making here is that the thing that elders do the most is make decisions. They had to make a decision. That's what leadership is for. I've often said, you know, if, you, if you think that it's problematic to have elders in the church because they're not perfect, obviously, try, try having a church with no elders. Try, try running a church. Try, try church growth. Try making decisions in a congregation where there are no elders. I've been there in the mission field. You've got maybe 100 people, a little over 100 people, young church, still no one really qualified to be an elder and you have to make decisions? Oh, you know, what are you going to do? Have the men's meeting, have a committee meeting, have a general, you know, there are 50 ways to do it. It's very tedious and very contentious. So elders don't make all the decisions. I mean, that would be kind of lording over the church, but they do make important decisions. Decisions about teaching. As guardians of the faith, they decide what will be taught and if what is taught is biblical when there is a dispute. Like in this case, there was a dispute. This was a doctrinal issue that they had to come up with a solution. Do we circumcise the, the Gentiles before, they, before we baptize them? Do, they, do we have to do that? Because if we do that, we'll keep the Jews and this group here, we'll keep them happy and they won't, you know, they won't complain and they won't cause a stink. But if we don't impose this on them, oh boy, we, we might have a church split and these, Pharisees, you know, these this particular group of Jew, Jews who became Christians, you know, they're going to be upset. We might divide the church. I mean, they, they had a hard decision to make. So they made that decision. They made a tough decision. And we don't hear a whole lot more about it, but we do know that this problem continued in the early church for a while, and the, the apostles had to battle it from place to place, but they made a decision. So we know that the you know, elders teach the church by their choice of materials and teachers. They are in effect influencing the entire church in the work of the different teachers. But they, they have to make a decision. You know, decisions about discipline, for example, 1 Corinthians 5, I'm not going to read that, but someone was being rebellious in the church at Corinth. They had to make a decision about that person. Paul tells the Corinthians to decide in the matter of disciplining sinful members. Elders make decisions about who will serve where and how they will serve. In Acts chapter six, you know, the church certainly chose men who would serve as deacons. We, familiar passage, we'll talk about that later, uh, later. But in that passage, those men who were chosen by the church, selected, put forward by the church, they were commended by the apostles, by the leaders. They had to make a decision and say, yes, these are good men. Yes, you can go ahead and do this work. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Paul talks about preachers being appointed by elders. Timothy, appointed commended by the laying on of the hands of the elders in the church. So my point is that elders are men who understand that they must make decisions. They understand how to make decisions, prayer, fasting, study, and they're able to continue when decisions don't go their way. Within the eldership, many times the trouble that happens there is that you have five elders, eight elders, whatever, the size of your church, three elders. And, and out of five elders, three decide, you know, we ought to do this. And the other two, they say, well, we think this is better. And, and, and they come to a resolution and say, well, okay, the major we'll go with the majority. And for the majority, that's fine. They, they, their vision is put into practice. But the other two who thought maybe plan B was better, what do they do? They can either become belligerent or passive aggressive 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure, okay, let's do that. You know, roll their eyes, which would be kind of childish. Or they can maintain that unity of spirit and that unity of leadership and, and go forward and do the best they can with a plan that they might not have selected. That requires a lot of maturity. What really requires maturity is if the plan selected doesn't turn out so well and has more problems than you thought, then the real maturity comes out. You know, my wife and I, I, I want to make a, a kind of a, a parallel here. My wife and I, we have a deal. We've been married 35 years, we have a deal. 36 years. And the deal is, if we have a big decision to make, we talk about it and we, you know, we look at it from all the angles and then we decide. And after the decision is made, there's never any back talk. In other words, if the thing goes down the tubes, in other words, I had a great idea and we talked about it and eventually she said, okay, well, no, let's, okay, let's go for it. Let's try for that. Let's buy the, uh, the Ford whatever, instead of she wanted to buy the Chevy. You know what I'm saying? And six months out, the Ford you know, needs a new transmission, is leaking oil, you know, it's a lemon. The deal that we have is that she will not say, well, I told you, you know, if we would have did what I wanted to do, you know, we'd, we'd be driving, we wouldn't be spending this money. That's the deal that we've had for 36 years on every decision. Once we're in, we're in, and there's no back talk after that. And I think that same spirit and that same attitude you know, ought to be in an eldership as well. You don't always get your way. You don't always, things don't always decide your way. But there's no back talk after that. We're in, we're together. If there's a problem, we'll deal with it. In Romans 14, 9, Paul says, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Sound advice. So elders understand that indecision is worse than wrong decision and consequently are not afraid of making the tough or even unpopular decision when those decisions are before them. Again, we're talking about broad qualifications and not specific qualifications, right? Number six, almost goes without saying, but elders are dependable. You know, James tells us that those who are unstable, another way of saying not dependable, those who are unstable will not have their prayers answered, James 1.8. Now, it may not be flashy or controversial, but you know what? Stability, reliability, durability, these are comforting and necessary traits for one who leads God's people. Do we want a leader in any, never mind in the church, do we want a leader like an office manager or a shop supervisor or a governor or, a, or, or a, you know, any type of leader? Do we want a leader who changes his mind every day? Do we, is it good, have you ever worked for an office manager that you know, one day it's this way and then the next day it's another way? You can't depend on them, you have to kind of test the wind every day you come in, oh, I wonder what's going to, you know, what are we going to focus on today? It's a terrible way to work. Well, it's a terrible way to lead. There's so many fads and fashions in religion so many wars and rumors of wars in the world, so many false Christs who try to influence the Lord's people. God shepherds, they need to be men who are able to you know, ride these waves and face the winds of change without overturning the boat by their foolishness or their fear. You know, elders are men who can be depended upon to say the right thing, do the right thing, be where they need to be and do the things year in and year out. You're probably saying, man, what kind of Superman is this? They're out there, we have them. You know, I had a friend in the church many years ago and was working in the mission field and, and you know, we'd, 
you know, Montreal, it's dark and cold, you know, in the, from December, to, like from about November, December, all the way through April, it's just dark. I mean, sometimes in January, you know, it's like, it's dark by four o'clock, you know, it's terrible. And it's cold, 25 below zero. And we used to go out and visit you know, new members or you know, do bio, home Bible studies, that kind of thing, in miserable weather like that. You know, it'd be 9.30, 10 p.m. on a Thursday night, you know, and we'd be getting back into the car and driving home, and I'd drop him off, and it'd be you know, past 10 p.m., and everybody was dead tired. And sometimes it was discouraging, the, the studies we had set up, they weren't home, they took off, nobody told us, you know, it wasn't fun. And he said to me, he was a member, and he said to me, no matter what happens, he said, I got your back. No matter what happens, I got your back. No matter what happens, said, they can all leave. And he said, I'll lead the prayer, and you pass the communion plate to me, and I'll pass it back to you, and then you put a dollar in the plate, and I'll put a dollar in the plate, and we'll put it away, and then you get up and preach a sermon, and I'll say amen. And then I'll get up and say the closing prayer and then together we'll lock up the building and put out the trash. I got your back. Elders are like that. Elders are like that. You know, we have seven elders. You know, I'd like to think if anything happened, if everybody you know, went away, if everybody abandoned the Lord, there'd still be seven people in the pew here. Seven people would remain in the pew. No matter what happens, you want a man that'll be there. And then number seven, elders are empathetic. This man can share his feelings. In uh, Romans uh, 20, verses 36, 38, Paul, uh, Luke writes, when Paul had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. You see all the emotional things that are said here? They knelt, they wept, they embraced, in those days, in that culture, you know, the Eastern culture, the kiss on the cheek. Elders are usually limited in being able to fix things. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we don't ask that they be trained as counselors you know, with licenses so that they can give psychological counseling or someone is suffering from uh, abuse issues. You know, they're not trained in counseling to fix that problem. They're not usually financially able to eliminate all the financial problems. You know, we don't have elders who are you know, multimillionaires who could just write one check, say, oh, roof needs replacing, 50 grand, no problem, here's a check, bang. Well, I know, I know Harold is rich, but other than that. Oh, it's Jane has got the money, okay. He married into money, there you go. You know, they, they can't fix that problem. They're not medically trained to heal, heal the diseases. But their job is not to fix, their job is to feed and to feel. Big difference. Feed and nourish the church with the word of God so that the church will be spiritually strong regardless of their physical, financial, or emotional strength. And feel with the church in times of joy as well as mourning and sadness. Cry with those who cry, rejoice with those who rejoice. What I'm saying is we're looking for men who have a range of emotion, who are able to express a range of emotion because they have to experience a range of emotions as they minister to people. Remember, their job is people. And people you know, have feelings. They're not afraid of anger, you know, somebody expressing anger. They're not afraid if someone is expressing resentment. They're not afraid to show happiness if someone is, wants a hug because they're so happy. They, 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 have a, they have a range of emotion that they, can, that they can express, that they can share with individuals. 
their ability to feel with you the happiness of a new baby or the pain of separation helps the church to understand that God cares and God knows how we feel. They say that children um, learn most of their unlearned you know, lessons, intuitive lessons about God from their fathers. You understand what I'm saying? Not, not from the Bible, which ultimately we do learn how and who God is, but I mean at the beginning, how, they, how they're pre-wired to think about God comes from how they think about their own fathers. And then hopefully we teach them from the word, you know, and so on and so forth, and they get a much more accurate vision of who the father really is. And hopefully they've had godly fathers and, and you know, there's a lot of crossover there. But in the church, we learn about the Father from our fathers in the faith, who are the elders. They're the ones who teach us in many instances how God is and who God the Father is. Elders are God's instruments to reassure His children that the notices that he notices every sparrow's falling, that he feels the sadness at the demise of each saint, and he rejoices at the return of every sinner. Do you know, I, I, can, I can picture God the Father saying to us as a church, when somebody asks us, how are you doing today? I can imagine God the Father saying, I want you children to say, the Lord has really blessed me. Could you imagine that coming out of the mouth of God the Father? I, I think I could hear Him say that. Just a small example. So I'm happy to say that our elders, you know, they're men who share the qualities I have just described. I'm not saying that all seven men have all, the qual all these qualities, but these qualities are found in all of them as a group. They're absolutely devoted to the Bible as God's only inspired word. I know that they do love the church and their loyalty for it is deep. Each of them have gifts that bless us in public worship and their private lives are filled with acts of service and purity that we don't see. The ministers get to see a little more because we're here more, we're closer. And they do understand decision making, and I've watched them as they refuse to back away from even difficult decisions. And these brothers are dependable servants who are not moved by every wind of doctrine and they are not afraid of the future, they look forward to it. When we hired our, our youth and family minister, one of the questions that was asked to him or that was posed to him during the interview was this. We said to uh, Mike, we said, um, uh, the Choctaw Church of Christ is a restoration church, an a cappella church. We like to think just a kind of a middle of the road church. We're interested in teaching sound doctrine, promoting unity of the faith, teaching our children to love, Lord, to love and serve the Lord. We're not there to make a point to anyone. We're not there to try on new stuff. We're quite comfortable in the things that we teach that they're accurate biblically. Would you be comfortable working in a church like that? Because that's who we are. And thankfully he said, no, that's the kind of church I was brought up in, that's where I want to work, that's where I'm at, great. Great. Not moved by every wind of doctrine. Somebody's got to steady the ship. Somebody's got to have a hand to steady the ship and direct the ship. And we've, we've given that responsibility to these men to steady the ship. These men have feelings, they're not afraid to show those feelings. Have we seen elders up front in tears? I have. I've seen our elders each their turn up there choked up with tears of joy or whatever, you know, feeling. I hear their laughter. I've watched them mend the brokenhearted and deal kindly with sinners. 
And of course, I pray that you will continue to encourage them and support them in this important work here in our own congregation and whatever congregation that you may be a part of for those who are watching online and who will see this lesson in the future uh, on a DVD or on our website. Okay, so a little, some of the, you know what I'm saying, some of the basic uh, qualifications or maybe characteristics that we're looking for in these men. Next time we're going to drill a little deeper and we're going to look at the specific qualifications of elders and take a look at 1 Timothy and Titus about those things. Thank you very much for your attention.